Hi everyone, uh, I'm Konstantin Saltuk and today we are going to talk uh, about async await and what, let's say, unexpected things we can achieve with it using just a little bit of creativity. So, but uh, to proceed, uh, we first need to start by understanding uh, what the C Sharp uh, C Sharp's async await is and what is what it does actually. So, and uh, in the context of this presentation, we will look at async await as a special compiler infrastructure that allows us to write asynchronous code in a straightforward manner. Uh, in general, it frees our code from ugly callbacks and makes the syntax of our methods more sequential and readable. Uh, let's, like, uh, let's look at these two examples. Uh, suppose we already have an uh, asynchronous API that returns a task. Without async await, as shown in the first example, we will have to pass callbacks uh, to define what happens once the task is completed. But async await uh, solves this problem by simplifying the syntax and making uh, the structure of our method clear and linear. So, and next, I want to talk about what cannot be achieved with async await, and specifically, it's a data parallelism. Let's say we have uh, some array of data and we want to process it in parallel. Uh, the first option is using parallel for each, and here we need to pass a callback to define what should be done for each element of the array. Uh, another option is to simply iterate through the array using a standard for each or for loop and use the task run and then wait all tasks in the end. Uh, or we can also use parallel extensions and as parallel and for all methods. But one thing that's uh, similar for all these approaches is that uh, we have to break our beautiful linear structure of method and create some lambdas to define the parallel execution logic. But it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, let's take a quick look at C++. Here, with uh, help of OpenMP, developer can add the pragma OMP parallel for, and a standard for loop will run in parallel. No special constructs, no separate methods or lambdas. You just use standard language construct and uh, ask it to run in parallel. And I find this approach simpler and most important, more natural. So, and the goal of my presentation is to show that something similar can be done in C-sharp. Since async await solved uh, the callbacks problem for asynchronous programming, uh, why don't use it here? So actually we can achieve this using the next C-sharp mechanisms. The I, I async enumerable with await for each operator, uh, async methods, but with custom task-like types and good old extension methods. So we will combine all these mechanisms uh, together and, and make them work together, actually. So how do we make it? Um, there are the main milestones. Uh, first, we will understand how async await works under the hood. Then we will define our own task-like type. Uh, and uh, implement fork join model using the async operations. And at the end, we will write an extension method that puts everything together. So uh, let's break down how async await works under the hood. Uh, let's take a look at simple method with await operators and see uh, to which low level C sharp code it actually compiles into. Uh, one note here, I've changed the names of some generated uh, classes and fields, so they are easily readable. And we can see in compiled code, uh, firstly, it creates an uh, instance of the state machine class. And uh, this class is generated by the compiler for each async method, and its move next method contains uh, all the parts of our original method. Uh, then an instance of uh, method builder class is created. And this method builder class, uh, in this case, async task method builder, is the class associated with the task type itself. 
uh, then uh, code in initialize the state flag uh, to minus one state counter and then it calls the start method on this method builder so and the method itself is um, it just simply returns uh, a task created by this method builder so and uh, now let's dive into the key part uh, the state machine itself uh, the compiler splits our original method into steps representing the code between the await operators and we can also see that uh, for each await operator uh, there is a corresponding field in the state machine that stores the relevant awaiter. So, and uh, let's look at the move next method itself. And it consists uh, of these steps corresponding to each part of original method. And um, first, each step executes uh, all non-asynchronous operations uh, as expected, like in, in the usual way. And at the end, when the awaiter needs to be awaited, uh, generated code updates the state uh, counter, and then uh, it checks uh, if the awaiter uh, isn't complete uh, using the is completed property. And if it's not, uh, state machine calls a special method await on completed on the method builder, passing the awaiter and the state machine itself. Uh, and it actually ca uh, can be await unsafe on completed or await on completed, depending on the implemented interfaces, but for now it's not very important. So, and then the method just returns. So, and once the awaiter finishes, uh, it triggers the execution of move next method one more time, allowing next step uh, to get result from this awaiter and continue the execution. So, and basically it's then repeated for every next step. So, and uh, now let's look closely at this await and save on completed method from the method builder class. So, and uh, generally uh, this method schedules the next step of state machine using the awaiter. The standard implementation uh, has some optimizations uh, to, to reduce locations, but generally there is some delegate that calls the move next method. And this delegate is passed to the awaiter. So uh, the move next is invoked when the awaiter completes and invokes its, invokes its continuation. So, and uh, the best part about async method builders is that their behavior can be customized. And one way to do this is by declaring your own task-like type let's call it parallel task. And this class needs to have a method called uh, get awaiter and the return awaiter must also implement the necessary methods for the await operator to work. But notice that uh, there is an async method builder attribute and here we specify the type of, of the method builder class. So what's the method builder? And uh, it actually must contain a certain members, uh, in particular, a static create method. Uh, it must also have a task property containing the resulting task. But the most important methods for us uh, in the context of this presentation uh, are start and await on completed. Uh, as we have seen before, uh, start method is invoked at the beginning and the await on completed method is invoked when await occurs and the awaiter is not yet completed. And uh, the important detail is we can introduce any custom logic here to specify how and when the next move next invocation will happen on the state machine. So um, what logic should we actually put here? And um, First step for achieving our goal is to implement a fork join model. Uh, let's recall what the fork join model is. And in general, it's a parallel programming paradigm where the execution flow splits into several parallel execution paths. And the, con the code then is executed across these multiple, let's say, threads. Uh, and it's what's the called uh, fork operation. And after that, parallel uh, when the parallel operations are completed, uh, the join 
uh, operation usually happens where the execution like joins back. So, and uh, let's try to implement the fork method by putting some unusual logic inside await on completed. And uh, instead of simply scheduling the execution of move next method, we will attempt something different. Uh, we'll launch uh, multiple task run executions that will each invoke the move next method. Uh, in case the awaiter is of our custom type uh, forking awaiter, for example. And the second uh, thing we can do is to ensure that this forking awaiter uh, always returns is completed as false. Uh, so the state machine is guaranteed to call await on completed instead of just uh, proceeding uh, the execution. So, and uh, let's see what we get from this approach. If we define a fork method that returns a task with this forking awaiter, we can see in the debugger that breakpoint after fork uh, is hit twice from two different threads, forked thread two and one in this example. And um, it kind of works, but it works only partially and it doesn't always function as expected because there is an important issue in the implementation we, and we can just uh, invoke move next multiple times. So let's take a look at state machine one more time. And what we can see here uh, is that the state machine holds mutable state. First, of course, it's uh, this uh, state counter and additionally, st state machine stores all the awaiters and actually even local variables of a method when the lifetime of these variables crosses the uh, boundaries of await operators. So, and um, the issue here is that, of course, we don't want multiple threads to execute move next concurrently and modify this shared state because, of course, it would lead to race conditions. And even in the simple example I showed you on the previous slides, uh, things can sometimes go wrong because uh, the state flag will be changed unexpectedly and the state machine will be not able to proceed to its final state. So, but uh, actually this problem can be solved and the solution is quite simple. Uh, each thread uh, must operate on its own copy of the state machine. And this can easily be achieved by copying the state machine. So we'll fork the world and uh, each uh, copy uh, of the state machine will execute uh, this move next method. Uh, so how do we copy the state machines then? Uh, and we need to understand that state machine is uh, just a plain C sharp object and uh, we can just perform a shallow copy of its data and um, of course, one way to do this is by reflection using the protected method member wise clone. Uh, while this would work, it would be quite slow. And yes, we can optimize this by compiling expressions, but uh, here is better news. And um, it's that in release mode, the compiler generates the state machine as a structure, not a class. And since uh, they are value types, uh, copying the structure costs almost nothing. We can simply assign it to a local variable and the result will be the same. So, and um, with this approach, a uh, fork works consistently uh, and we can see that no, it actually works. <laughs> uh, but if we want to do something useful and not just hit the breakpoint twice, uh, we need to be able to identify at which one of the forked threads we are running on. And this is a good moment to talk about the execution context. Uh, basically, execution context is a set of information associated with the execution process. And in asynchronous operations, we are actually have to preserve the execution context and then uh, restore it when switching tasks. However, it's not just a burden and we can actually benefit from it. Specifically, uh, by preserving execution context, we can now uh, use the async local variable. And async local uses the internal API of 
execution context to provide a way to store and read the custom data. And we can create an entity, let's call it parallel context, uh, where we store async local variable. And uh, in this variable, we can uh, save, let's say, an ID for each thread before uh, invoking this uh, move next method. And user code can later access this data at any moment uh, it wants and proceed with any business logic. So in the, in the example, I pinned the parallel context ID in the riders debugger. And we can see that after the await fork, there are two threads. One of them has a parallel context ID of zero and another one has it as one. So yeah, it works. And from here, we can proceed with uh, any business logic. Let's say process a chunk of the array based on our ID. Yeah, but before we rush into implementing the parallel for each, uh, we need to implement the join method. And um, we need all threads except one to stop executing. This is actually quite simple to implement. We will just not <laughs> call the move next method. And uh, using our parallel context, uh, we can detect the thread with ID of zero and allow it um, only that thread to proceed. And for all other threads, we can simply exit uh, the await on completed method and do nothing. So the continuation will not be invoked and all other forked states of state machine will not proceed the execution. And um, actually, it's important to note that the join operation typically means that the main thread should uh, wait for all other threads to finish before proceeding. And in reality, there are some additional synchronization here. But for the sake of simplicity of this demonstration, it's enough for now. And um, finally, let's look at this piece of code. What if we? call a method uh, where a fork happens, but we don't perform a join before exiting the method. So what would happen from the test method point of view? And uh, to answer this question, we need to begin with looking at the final stage of the state machine. Uh, at the end, it sets the state to minus two and calls the set result on the method builder. And it passes the return result. Uh, the standard task method builder, uh, it handles this by attempting to set the result on task. Uh, and of course, task can only have one result. And if result is already set, invalid operation will be shown. So in our case, uh, on the second fork of the state machine, uh, on the set result, we will get an uh, exception. Uh, and this is, of course, not what we want. But since we can customize the set result method, we can implement behavior in our parallel task that allows uh, set result to be called multiple times. And we need to ensure that if multiple threads call uh, this set result, the continuation that is scheduled in the tasks awaiter will also be executed multiple times and provide uh, return values for all of them. There are a few non-obvious points in the implementation, especially uh, what to do if the continuation hasn't set been hasn't been set yet. And uh, while some threads already reached this set result uh, method, so for this reason, I will not go into full implementation details here. However, uh, it's fairly straight, straightforward. And for those who are interested, you can check out the uh, implementation in the repository, which I will provide a link at the end of the presentation. But uh, with the correct implementation, um, we can observe this beautiful behavior that makes the fork and join operations uh, basically composable with each other and with other methods. So, and now we have all building blocks we need uh, to implement the parallel for each using the async await. Uh, let's take a look at which low level C-sharp uh, async await compiles into. 
And as we can see in async enumerable, instead of move next, there is move next async, which is called and awaited in a loop. Instead of dispose, dispose async is called and awaited. And at the beginning, instead of get enumerator, the get async enumerator method is invoked. However, get async enumerator method itself is not awaitable. It's not async. So we have a clear point where we can perform the join in the dispose async method, but we don't have a simple point at the beginning to perform the fork uh, since get async enumerator is not async. Uh, but this isn't a big of a problem since, since we will likely want to use the await for each on regular lists and arrays. We will need an extension method to convert uh, this collection into async enumerable. So let's call uh, this method as parallel async and we will make it actually async. Uh, this method will handle the forking and return the enumerable that iterates over a needed chunk for this forked thread. And um, there will be nothing special in the move next async, just a reg regular enumerator advance. And at the end, uh, we will just perform a join inside dispose async. So, and the implementation of this method is, uh, is fairly straightforward. We simply perform an await fork. And after that, we create a chunk enumerable for the appropriate segment of the collection. And the chunk enumerable is a class that implements async enumerable behavior. And the only thing that stands out is that in uh, its enumerator, this in dispose async, we perform the await join. So, and uh, let's see that it works. Uh, and in this example, uh, we first pre print processing element, and then after small delay, we print uh, finish processing element. And as you can see from the output, the elements indeed are processed in parallel. However, this isn't exactly what I promised at the beginning. And the difference lies here uh, in this additional await. So we have await for each var item in await. Why is the await? It's not what I promised. So let's try to get rid of that. And if we take another look at the low level code and try to remove this additional await, uh, we will be left with just two awaits, uh, one in move next async and another one in dispose async. So if we want to perform forking in this situation, we have no other choices except to make it in move next async. So it has to fork on the first invocation and then invocations um, in, the, in the next invocations uh, should uh, forking should not be performed. And instead, uh, we'll just advance the enumerator uh, as usual. And in the end, we will perform dispose async uh, as normal. So, but uh, how to implement such an enumerator? Uh, the simple part is that we perform the fork operation in the beginning and find the chunk uh, for our thread uh, and then perform the actual move next uh, for this chunk. But the second part is uh, that we need to somehow save this chunk enumerator uh, and ensure that in the following move next invocation, we could use this saved data instead of forking again. So, but uh, how to store and read this data in the enumerator? Uh, and unfortunately, uh, storing it in the state of the enumerator itself is not a solution uh, because if you make enumerator a class, the field uh, holding the data will be shared across all threads uh, since the enumerator uh, was created before forking and uh, each thread will have the same reference for this enumerator. So the same field will be accessed. Uh, another option is to make the enumerator a structure. So each thread would have its own local copy on stack of this structure. 
and the changes would persist. Uh, however, uh, it's where we start being limited by the async await implementation. For structs, async methods are always invoked on a struct copy in the generated state machine. So uh, asynchronous method in structs can never actually modify the struct state. I mean, uh, of course they can, but uh, the change will be lost from the caller's point of view. So, and for the quite similar reason, we cannot use uh, the async local to store the data because the execution context will be restored to its original state after exiting the move next async method. However, uh, we can create a data store using uh, our parallel context. We can, let's say, allocate a dictionary, a concurrent dictionary at the moment of forking and store it alongside the ID. And um, then create some entity uh, like async local, uh, but it would store the data inside this parallel context dictionary. And uh, with this approach, we will need to manually clear the data, of course, uh, so this dictionary will not just grow and grow. But here we can easily perform it in dispose async. So, and this way we can store data in parallel local and implement a move next method correctly. Uh, and with this, we basically achieved our goal and eliminated this additional await. Uh, and of course, uh, this approach introduces a bit more overhead since we will need to access this parallel local on each iteration of the loop. However, this overhead should be negligible, especially when dealing with heavy operations uh, that we actually want to parallel. And just for fun, I decided to compare uh, parallelization methods using JetBrains AI Assistant in Rider. First, I use the AI assistant to generate a program that iterates over a list using parallel for and regular for each and measures the time. Uh, then here I ask the AI assistant to add uh, more options with a prompt at another parallel parallelization methods using extensions from list parallel extensions. And list parallel extensions is a file where I kept both implemented methods one called as parallel async and second one called uh, as parallel async2. And AI assistant made it and generated code uh, actually runs. And we can see that, uh, yeah, that uh, as parallel async with additional await works even faster than the standard parallel for each, while as parallel async without the extra await performs slightly slower. And of course, it's not a proper benchmark, but it gives us a general idea of the performance, like it's not drastically slow. And more detailed benchmarks can actually be found also in the repository if you are interested. So, and um, yeah, let's uh, look at the AI assistant working one more time. <laughs> so, and... Um, it's uh, when, where I originally wanted to conclude the presentation. However, uh, while I was working on the preparation, another idea came to mind. So I've added a few more slides, but I promise it will take just a minute. So let's look one last time at this low level code. One more opportunity we have here is the fact that compiler does not require this get async enumerator method to be an instance member. So instead of creating parallel enumerable that only returns this lazily forking enumerator, we can actually define the get async enumerator method itself as the extension for collections and directly return the enumerator here. So now we can just add an await before for each over a regular collection and the body of the loop executes concurrently. Uh, here, Rider even suggests to add a uh, using directive in case this invisible extension method is not imported yet. And the, resu the resulting code uh, looks even cleaner. Uh, however, from my point of view, this approach is more of an evil. Yeah, I mean, this looks cool and clean, but it makes the intention less obvious and there is nothing that clearly indicates parallelism. 
Uh, while in the previous approach, we had an explicit uh, indication of this fact with the method name. So, and uh, I'm not sure how big of a problem this really is. So uh, let's vote. Uh, we are going to run a poll on YouTube. So please answer. If you had to choose one of these options, would you prefer the first cleaner one or the second more explicit one? And while uh, you are voting, uh, I would like to highlight one thing I hope you will take away with you today. And it's that the unexpected possibilities and room for improvements can exist even within well-established systems like async await in our example. So don't limit yourself to what's already known and push the boundaries. So, and now that's it. Thank you for your attention. And this is a QR code that leads to GitHub repository with this library. Really nice talk. Um, I was watching it, and, and when I saw the, the code example, even before this talk, I was thinking this is exactly spot on the right balance between crazy and elegance. I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually have a, have, a, have a question looking through everything, and, and that didn't came up when I was looking through the code base as well. Uh, but did you have to do anything special to make things like cancellation tokens and so on? Um, work nicely with this? Yeah, uh, so for now, uh, it's easy. Cancellation is just not supported. <laughs> I mean, uh, you can uh, support it, but you will need manually on the each uh, iteration of the loop check this cancellation token. Uh, but I assume we could come add some uh, checks in the enumerator itself, for example and support it yeah so but uh, for in this case it will be it we will anyway need to use the extension method so like as parallel async with constellation token for example and yeah it would work then yeah and, and then i guess it's possible to do like a graceful shutdown of all of the threads that have been forked and, and all yeah, of that of course, of course. Yeah. cool I'm, I'm looking forward to the commits of that one <laughs> Okay. Uh, Matthias, did so, yeah, and, you uh, have any uh, other questions? Actually, yeah. So, and uh, uh, to clarify the things, for, for now, it's not a like library that is production ready. Of course, it's more like an experiment uh, that I'm performing. And, but I'm planning to finish some things and uh, publish it as a uh, new get. Uh, yeah. Yeah, one other question, how, how does this relate to testing or how does it deal with testing in mind when you test that? Yeah, so <laughs> this, this library itself uh, is not very easy. Uh, I mean, it's, it's always not easy to test the parallel libraries, but here especially when it's combining the async behavior with the parallelisms. Uh, but in general, uh, if we are talking about user code that uses this library and we want to test it, it's, it's just the same as if user code uses a parallel for each, but with a neat syntax. So I don't see, see any difference here. Uh, by the way, the, the poll has finished on YouTube, and it uh -huh. looks like people are um, very much in favor of the more explicit version with as parallel async. Yeah, and so not uh, not everyone is evil. Yeah, of course. So yeah, and it's kind of expected because you know uh, when it's just a normal collection and you just add and await before for each. Yeah, it's you could you could expect that it's like a normal async iteration over a collection and for example you could put the results in a normal dictionary that is defined somewhere uh, before but it will break in this case so yeah as parallel async extension method is the way to go very cool um you also opened up the talk with uh, with the fact that yeah a lot of the the parallelization options that are in .NET are sometimes incompatible and so on. Um, do you foresee any issues if you combine this approach, for example, with system.trace uh, 
trading that channels? Uh, yeah, so if you combine it with any mm, synchronization primitive or with channels, it will work fine. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, once again, it will work just uh, like in the normal parallel uh, for each, for example, but the thing that is actually interesting uh, to consider when combining is the normal async methods. So let's say uh, we have this, uh, uh, our special method with parallel tasks and we iterating over a collection in parallel. And in the body of this method, we can actually await a regular methods. Uh, so in one of uh, examples I show, uh, I, yeah, I showed it was await task delay, for example. And actually it composes quite well. Uh, so it actually brings more compatibility be between uh, language constructs, uh, but there is another issue and it's what happens if a regular async method uh, awaits our parallel async method. And um, actually it will work fine unless uh, you perform, for example, um, this case where I show that we await a method that forks and then it, it uh, doesn't join. So the calling method is also forked. Yeah, and uh, I supported this behavior in parallel task methods, but if you try to do the same from uh, regular async method, uh, you will get actually a, a, an exception, but it's a good exception. It's like a, I added a special validation that if you wait a parallel task method from the regular async method, it checks that uh, this uh, awaited method it doesn't perform additional forks and etc. So, yeah, it's what about the compatibility? Very cool. Um, again, one of those things I have to play with because it's it's like I said, it's be beautiful and crazy. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, any, I have, are there I any questions not... from the audience or? Ah, yes, yes, actually, yes. Uh, that, was, that was the next one. And it could have been me, actually. Uh, the original question was, could you recommend any book to extend knowledge about async parallel programming approaches in C Sharp? Yeah, uh, so uh, I can't recommend any books on this just because, mm, especially this, um, like, no, it's kind of a new approach when we can change the method builders, like, but it's maybe, I don't know, a few years old, maybe five years old. But uh, there are really good uh, talks about uh, this async await and how it works, and they are available on, uh, I believe, even on uh, the JetBrains events, it was some talk from... Uh, so maybe, maybe. So uh, basically, uh, he he told about uh, how async await works under the hood, but without without touching the async method builders, and um, but it's where I get some inspiration from. Let me try. I was to... quickly looking for the talk. If I find it, me I too. will definitely post it in the chat. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Constantine, thank you for your talk. This was uh, this was great to see. Um, yeah, thank you. I think Constantine. it's time to to say goodbye, not yeah. only to you. Yeah.